Hi, I'm Jessica, and when I'm not drinking all the coffee, watching Razorback sports, or hanging out with my family of boys, it's my passion to help elementary music teachers just like you find your unique teaching style. My goal with this podcast is to share helpful tips, strategies, and to give you the motivation you need to gain momentum in your teaching so you can continue being the music teacher rock star you already are. Hey everyone, welcome back to episode 62. Today is an interview with Audrey Jones of Miss Jones Music Room. You can find her on Instagram and Facebook at Miss M-I-S-S Jones Music Room. Today's conversation is all about what it's like teaching in a large school to 700 plus students and also what it's like teaching music in a Title I school. This conversation, once it got going, took a lot of good twists and turns that I just loved this conversation, and I am so excited for you to take a listen today. A little bit more about Audrey. She is passionate about cultural relevance and compassion in the classroom. Outside of school, she likes to run. She's a worshiper and a dog mama to who she professes is the cutest dog in the world. So without further ado, let's jump right in with today's episode. Welcome back to the podcast. Today I am talking to Audrey Jones and I cannot wait to talk to her today about what it's like to teach in a large school, well to a lot of students in the music room. And I'm just going to go ahead and let her start off by telling you a little bit more about herself. Hey y'all. So my name is Audrey Jones and I am a fifth year teacher in Texas. I teach at a large Title I school. We bounce between 650, 7, and occasionally over 700 kids. It just kind of depends on um, transiency and, you know, CPS and all that stuff. So we have a lot of kids in and out. Um, But I am starting my fifth year. I love it. It is the best job in the world. It is absolutely insane, but I love it so much. So yeah, it's, it's good. It's all good. I love it. It's mostly a, um, mostly Hispanic school, Mm -hmm. uh, but we have lots of cultural diversity, but I think we're over 75, 80% Hispanic. So. Oh, awesome. Well, you, I mean, definitely could share some things about that too, because um, I know that that is something I'm unfamiliar with. And so with having, is it a large Spanish speaking population at your school? We have quite a few. It's pretty large. It's actually between that and our Asian students. Oh, wow. ELL. Um, because for some reason, the Asian community, it's not the biggest um, in my city, but it's one of the largest. And so mm-hmm. we have quite a few um, Asian students. Well, I think that's our second biggest population at my school. Okay. So it's very eclectic. Okay. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So if you could share a favorite thing or favorite things about teaching music, what would it be? Uh, I think my most favorite thing is that I get to see all of the students in the school. And so I get to meet them when they come in as little babies and watch them grow up. And so when I first started, I didn't have pre-K or kindergarten. I just had first through fifth. Um, But now I've added more. But my very first group of kiddos as first graders are now fifth graders. And so it's like that year where I'm like, my little babies have all grown up. Mm -hmm. So I think getting to see them the whole time that they're at my school um, is my very most favorite thing because other teachers, you know, they're in first grade, and then they move to second grade, and then they have right. to restart with them. And I'm like, oh, no, like I had this kid last year, like I completely understand how they operate. So oh. that's my favorite thing. Oh, yeah. And then <laughs> that's so true. I mean, it's forming relationships, but I'm laughing because having some of those fifth grade, I just especially think of the boys, I'm not trying to label, but it just right. the puberty thing, which girls and boys both experience, but they try to get this like tough demeanor and, you know, like, come in into music acting like they don't know you and you're like here's right. the thing. I've you know I've called you you know I've called my bluff with you since you were little right. so this is not gonna work in here okay right. exactly <laughs> exactly and then pretty soon they're like okay miss <laughs> <laughs> with their deeper voice and you're like this is yeah. awkward but okay <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about you teaching in a large, not just a large school with a lot of students, but also Title I. Right. So this is something I am so excited to dive into because, first of all, I'm sure you've been asked this question when teachers know that you teach a, you know, a school with a lot of students. How in the world do you form a relationship 
with all those students um, when you, you know, you, you probably don't see them very often and then yeah. you have a lot of them. So how do you form a relationship with that many students? Well, and I'm going to say this too. My dog has just now decided she needs to play fetch. So I'm trying to grab the ball and throw it. So if you hear her growling, just. It is. No, you are totally fine. <laughs> I think the biggest thing for me is I really, 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 really work the first like month of school, which really now it's not an issue because I know them. Mm-hmm. But like my first year, I spent forever learning their names because I feel like once you learn their names and you learn how to say it correctly, um, that forms that immediate bond with them because so many of our kids, so many of our kids have difficult names. And I was watching, um, Chelsea Hillard teaching in pearls. I was watching one of her vlogs uh, a couple of weeks ago or a couple of days ago. And she made a really good point. She said, it's not an option for you to mispronounce students' names. It's not an option because it's too hard or because you're not quite sure. Ask them, like ask right. them how to say it. And I mean, I have some kids that I I look at their names and I'm like, I have no clue. And so I'll just go to them and I won't do it in front of the class, but I'll go to them and I'll say, okay, I really want to know how to say your name correctly. How do you say it? Teach me how to say it. And if I mess it up the first couple of times, I'm really sorry, but I'm really working at it. And so I think making that first instant connection of learning each student's name, and it's really hard, Mm -hmm. especially when you have a lot of students that have Jaden or Caden, you know, and there's a lot of students have the same name, but really making an effort. And a lot of that comes through like name games and stuff too, you know, like down down slow, jump in, jump out, all that stuff. Um, So that would be my number one thing is to learn every student's name. And then I have this box. It was an idea that I got from a fellow teacher in my district and I call it the Dear Miss Jones box. And it sits, I've moved it this year. It's sitting on my bookshelf kind of towards the back of the room and the students can write me letters they can draw me pictures they can give me their basketball schedules or whatever Mm -hmm. and if they write me a a letter or do anything and put it in that box I take it out at the end of the day and I'll sit down at my desk and I'll write them a note back I'll put their name on it and put it back on the board but that way they build that relationship and I've had kids tell me like things are really scary at home I don't want to go home and so then you know, I'll go talk to the counselor or administration or I'll have kids say like, that was such a fun lesson. Or I had one student, like, I really hate your class, but I wanted to tell you that oh, you know, it's still that relationship where it's yeah. like, well, I know this isn't your favorite thing and that's okay. Um, yeah. so I do that. And then if they do give me their schedules, I'll try, you know, you can't go to everything because with six, 700 kids, you can't do everything. Mm-hmm. But I'll, you know, try to go to like a football game or a volleyball game or whatever, because it's just important for them to see you. And then when I see them in the hallway um, or in the cafeteria or in the library, um, I may pop in and be like, Hey, so-and-so, Hey, how are you? Like, how's things going? And, or, you know, Hey, how's your mom? How's your grandma? Things like that. And just trying to connect with them. And it takes 15 seconds of my life at that point to talk to 10 kids, you know? Yeah. So just being really intentional. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I love well, I love all, everything you said, and I love the learning the names part. Um, I had an experience of teaching at a school with a high population of African-American students, and there were some names that were very hard to pronounce, And but it was, I, I like you said, I didn't mispronounce. I would say, who is this? And I would sometimes spell it out, or mm-hmm. they all, some of them already knew, the ones that had hard and pronounced names are like, Ah, oh, it's, you know, Shaquisha. And then right. I'd be sitting there like, okay, thank you so much for pronouncing that. And then, you know, but right. it's, you're not trying to offend them. But a lot of times it is so hard when you were looking right. at this name. And a lot of times they're not pronounced the way they're spelled too, but being intentional about letting them know you matter in here. And I really do care about knowing not just your name, but you, Right. the box idea is genius because as music teachers, whether you have a small number of students, amount of students, or a large amount like you do, it's very hard to connect with them on a personal level and relationally because you don't see them very often. And when you do see them, you got to cram so much into that, you know, small amount of class time. I love the box idea. And I also love what you said about even the student that said, I hate music class, but you didn't immediately go, all right, where is he? I'm going to find this child. You were like, that's okay. And he felt like he could be honest and trusted you enough to be able to say that, but knew you were still going to love him. 
Right. I love that. It's about relationships and it's so true. It's about giving the high fives. How are you? You know, just smiling as they walk in your room. The little things I feel go a long way. Don't you you agree with that? Absolutely. And I mean, I'll be honest, last year was okay. My first year of teaching was really, really hard. It is for anybody. Mm -hmm. My first year of teaching, um, because my school is so big, we have two PE coaches, but one me, but that's okay. (laughs) Oh, wow. I'm like, okay. (laughs) Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. (laughs) I'm here by myself, but one of our PE coaches passed away, like right towards the last six weeks of the school year. And it was really, really hard. Mm -hmm. Um, So the kids and I got super close that year. Um, But last year was probably my second worst year because I ended up having to have surgery and I had to take all this time off. But I didn't even fret about my kids and their behavior because I had set that expectation in place and we have that good relationship. And so, you know, before I left, obviously I didn't tell them what kind of surgery I was having or anything, but um, before I left, you know, there were some tears because they were so sad that I was going to be gone. But then when I got back, it was like, we hopped right back into it. They were ready to go. And those relationships were still just as strong, if not stronger, you know? And so no matter what you find, like if you end up on maternity leave or you end up having to have surgery, whatever, as long as you have those relationships with your kids, they're going to be right there when you get back. And Mm -hmm. so that is, that is the key to like my teaching philosophy, I guess, is building relationships with my kids. Yeah, that's awesome. And you've set that positive environment in your classroom. And so they know, you know, they're already, they walk in and they know it's a happy place to be and it's a positive environment and they want to be there. So that's, that's amazing. Thank you. Okay. So back to the conversation about having a million students, (laughs) how do you keep track of that? What I mean by keep track of them is assessment wise and right. chart wise and all those, you know, data tracking stuff. How do you keep track of that many kids and keep track of their progress? So this is like a work in progress. <laughs> right. And that's okay. Right. So my first three years, I had duct tape on my floor, which annoyed me, but it was the only thing I knew to work until I discovered the beauty of sit spots. <laughs> and I love sit spots, but you know, I have to have like 50 sit spots and that's fine, but I'll put them in rows this year. I'm going to change it up a little bit and label them. I'm going to have it spell out like the row spot music. So I'll have like M1, M2, you know? Oh yeah. I have them on sit spots. And so like this time of year, when everybody's doing their bulletin boards and doing, which I have been doing, I'm sitting at my computer for hours, making templates of first grade seating chart first grade assessment. And I kind of plan when that's going to be. So that way, you know, October 3rd rolls around and I'm not like, Oh, I haven't done any assessments, you know? And so I just make a template and I kind of take the first couple of weeks to get them, you know, in their routine, get them sitting down because, you know, you get, you tell kids to choose a spot where they're going to sit by their best friend or someone you need to be sitting by. Uh I have to feel it out with them and see who I need to move. But then after that, I just keep it pretty solid. My older kids, I'll switch. It depends on the class. I'll switch either every six weeks. I'll let them choose a new spot or I switch them at Christmas. My kindergartners, once they have their spot, they don't move because it's hard enough. Oh gosh. (laughs) Because I have last year, I had 53 or 55 kindergartners for 25 minutes and then switched it and had 53 kindergartners. Oh my gosh. So by the end of the year, we find it one time Mm -hmm. that, oh my word. Okay. Did they come in with an aid or you were just, you're it. Yes, oh my God. gosh. Blind solo. Yeah. Oh girl. That's a, that's an experience in itself. <laughs> well, and we're blocked off for 55 minutes, right? Uh huh. So I had two sections of kindergarten and then we had a five minute transition and two more sections of kindergarten. And so my first, probably three months of last year, I was like, what am I doing? Who, what is going on? I, okay. I'm losing my mind. I need <laughs> Right. You know, but after you get in that routine with them, you just make it work. Right. But they never, they never, ever, 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 ever move their spots ever. You know, <laughs> you're like, I will glue you here. <laughs> I know. Except I can, but you know, <laughs> you have to stay here because if not, it's going to be an upheaval of the other 54 kids in my class. So I think it's easier with them if I just don't move them. Right. And then first and second grade and third grade, I usually let switch at Christmas. I'll let them choose their own spots because by then they kind of, you know, they kind of know. So mm-hmm. 
And then assessment wise, I just make a template Mm -hmm. and I just kind of already know, you know, I'm going to do a quick walk around. They're doing stations, check off my list, put it in the computer and go. Um, But if I don't spend the time pre-planning now, it's not going to happen or I'm going to be so stressed out that it's just not worth it. And so I do a lot of that prep work at the beginning of the school year. Yeah, I think that's great because, I mean, I feel like any planning you can do before the beginning of the school year will set you up for success, whether it's, you know, creating a new classroom management plan or looking at what worked last year and, you know, planning for, you know, replanning it for this year. Or right. like you said, if it's a seating chart or how are you going to assess your students? It's, it's about not going in blindly, but really having a plan. And the more you plan, the more you're going to set yourself up for success, whether, you know, especially if someone's listening to this and you have a lot of students and you feel like you've really been struggling with keeping track of it all, the more planning you do up front, even though it's a lot of work up front, it will really, really help you in the long run. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, stuff comes up that you're like, oh, I got to move that, but you already have it in place. So you just rearrange. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, that's true. Okay. So let's talk about your programs, like your performances you do with that many students. Has it been like a work in progress and have you had to change things up from time to time or do you just do it by grade level or how in the world do you do performances with that many students? So performances are interesting at my school. Um, We are a leader in me school which we're actually, it's really cool because we're title one, but we're leader in me. And we've, we've also gotten lighthouse status, which is a super big deal. Um, and so we have to have these programs that are leadership night programs. Okay. So, um, usually the way it works is in around October, we have a first grade, second grade, third grade program. No, that's wrong. I'm sorry. In October, we have a fourth and fifth grade program. And so since I have two PE coaches, what we do is we kind of combine it and we'll do part of it being music and part of it being PE. And so I'll take, like last year, I took Artie Almeida's um, Who Let the Dog Out, Who Mm -hmm. Let the Dogs Out plate routine and did that. So I did it with plates, but then I added drums and boom whackers. And it didn't matter what note the boom whackers were. I just wanted the kids doing it. And I threw some rhythm sticks in there. Yeah. So you kind of just take things and make them bigger for bigger groups. And so we did the exact same program with fourth grade and the exact same program with fifth grade. So I did the music and dance part. And then the coaches did a PE part and we worked together to make it happen. Um, And then we do kind of similarly in the spring, but we have first, second and third grade. And so usually I take first grade. And I just solely have all my first graders and the coaches will take second grade and we'll have the first grade program going on at the same time as the second grade program. So my program's in the cafeteria, theirs is in the gym, and then we combine third grade and we'll do it. Now, the one program a year um, that I'm like, what am I doing with my life? I love it is Veterans Day. So our Veterans Day program is second grade through fifth grade. And so I have- majority of my kids. And so I have my choir on the risers in our cafeteria. Then my second graders are all on the floor. My third graders are in one section of the cafeteria. My fourth graders are in one section of the cafeteria. My fifth graders are in another section. And then the parents and the veteran, well, the veterans are in the middle, but Mm -hmm. the parents kind of have to funnel in where they can. And so I've had to master the art of directing a choir and then making sure all of my, <laughs> but my um, homeroom teachers at my school are incredible. They are so supportive. They like, if there's a kid not doing what they're supposed to, they pull them, you know, they move them around. So it's really, I would not be able to do what I do without my PE coaches and the homeroom teachers, especially for that program. So those I spend probably from October one until Veterans Day, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. That's the majority of what we work on in our class Mm -hmm. because there is so many of them. And, you know, if one grade level gets off singing, then I have to like redirect. And so I really work on solidifying that, but we don't have a Christmas program um, because we have a pretty, it's not as much, but we're still just kind of setting our ways. And I don't know, Um, but we have a pretty heavy Jehovah's witness population. Okay. And so for a lot of our kids, it's not an option. Right. Um, And then a lot of our um, Asian students will travel back with their families to um, Vietnam or wherever they're going. And so we lose a lot of them, you know, around the holidays anyway. Okay. I don't have to do 
a Christmas program, a winter program, and I don't really have any other holiday programs. And then at the end of the year, I have a kindergarten program that I plan with the kindergarten teachers. So a lot of it is working cohesively and having a good relationship with my classroom teachers. Yeah. That's a big part of it. It really is. And I know it's, it's hard because everybody doesn't have a good relationship with the classroom teachers, but I feel like just like it takes time to develop relationships with your students, it it takes time to build relationships with these teachers. And sometimes it does feel like it's, well, maybe not sometimes, a lot of times it feels like you're on an island all on your own as the music teacher. And so you feel like, how do I, you know, form relationships with these teachers? But just getting out there and, you know, talking to them and going to Friday happy hour or whatever it is, and just getting to know them, they will really want to support you and support what you're doing in the music room. Um, I think it's really important. Oh, it's so important. And before my, well, in my school's a newer school. I think this is our 11th year, I think. But before I came, no music teacher had lasted longer than two years. And so they were so used to turnover, 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 that I've had to kind of prove myself that, Mm. you know, I I feel like some of the teachers were kind of like, well, why should we be invested if this girl's just going to leave? And so like this last year, finally, one of the teachers that I just couldn't seem to connect with just all of a sudden, like we hit it off. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of it too, is you unfortunately have to prove yourself that you're going to stick around because there's so many kids, there's so much going on that there was just so much turnover at my school. So I think that's a huge part of it too, is like, showing them that you're serious about your job and you're not just going to play a movie all day and you want to be there. So, no, that's so true. I mean, I can completely relate to that. I taught at a title one school and there was a lot of turnover because my school had a lot of discipline issues and a a lot like there, when I came, there had not been music for seven years, but there had been art. Well, she was like the fourth art teacher. And so it's the same deal. Like they just, they like they were they were nice, mm-hmm. but I think they thought I was just going to run for the hills. Which don't get me wrong, I thought about it because it was very oh. hard. Oh, but I, I stuck it out. I was there seven years, and they realized, okay, she's here for the long run. And it took time. Just like with think about it, like a friendship. I mean, right. it's not like you meet. I mean, maybe some friendships hit it off right away, but you usually it just takes time. You got to invest in that relationship for it to grow. And oh, so, absolutely. you know, if you're listening to this and you're struggling with some relationships with teachers, then don't give up it will happen. Just, it's like, you know, planting a seed and it'll grow just like your students. (laughs) For sure. For sure. Okay. So let's talk about being at a title one school because this, um, has a lot of different meanings to it and every title one school is different. Mm -hmm. And so I know for my experience, I did not have a, like a budget at all at first. Mm -hmm. And then I finally got a tiny one. And then it just was, you know, frustrating feeling like there was a lot of behavior issues and there wasn't a lot of support. I just, I'll keep it at that. And so it just became very frustrating. So let's talk about, first of all, advice for someone. Well, let's talk about your experience. When you started at your school, did you have resources to teach with an instruments or did you have to kind of slowly build that up or how did it look for you? Well, the district did, wow. If I could use words today, that'd be awesome. (laughs) Let me try that again. The district that I'm in, I'm very blessed because our um, our district supports fine arts like incredibly. And so I walked into a school, and I don't know how often these instrument, instruments have been used, mm-hmm. but I walked into a school where I had, I have like nine um, Tobano drums. I have, right. you know, a big bass bar. So I have quite a bit. I mean, I obviously don't have enough for every student to have their own but I walked into having quite a bit to work with. And um, we are so fortunate that we get to have incredible PD at the beginning of every year for one or two days. And we'll have people like Artie Almeida, like Mm -hmm. Amy Abbott, you know, all these people, our district will pay for them to come in. And then we get their resources. The district will buy their resources for us. And so I came into a situation where I had resources and I had instruments, um, you know, that I could use. And so I just kind of did that, but I also, um, had somebody who had kind of, there were the people that took me in during college and are basically like my parents. And she knew kind of the school setting I was walking into and said, well, you know, we kind of want to help you out because we know you don't really have a budget. So, um, 
just tell me a few things you want and we'll make it happen. And so I was able to buy, you know, um, boom whackers and just a few things like that, that mm-hmm. we didn't have, but I was very fortunate to walk into a place where it wasn't necessarily purchased by my school, but it was funded through the district. Mm-hmm. And so I have all of these resources that I can use. Now that's not to say that I still don't spend a lot of money out of my own pocket. Um, but what teacher doesn't, you right. know, Oh, completely. Now, like when it comes to school wise, I don't really have a budget. I mean, I can go in, but I don't really ask for things because I have a lot, but I can go, Hey, would it be possible to get 10 recorders or, you know, and they, they try to do what they can to work with me. Um, but my administration is incredible and, you know, they, they say, well, we can't do this, but we can do this or, you know, um, so it's, it's a little different there. Like we don't have a PTA, we don't have anything like that. Um, so it's kind of just do it yourself. Um, but we, we have a church that's come alongside and like this year they bought every single student a backpack and school supplies. And so our kids don't have to worry about that. So it's just kind of, it's, it's a different situation because we are so, I don't want to say unfortunate, that's not the right, underprivileged. Right. Um, our students are, but our district takes care of us so well. So that's amazing. Yeah, Yeah, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. So if a teacher is walking into a situation and they don't have that support or they don't have finances to get what they need, how would you encourage them that that's okay, that they can still teach music even in a title one school without Uh, any resources? Absolutely. It is totally okay. Like I think sometimes because I've been not very often, not very often at all, but I've been displaced from my room where, you know, I walk in and they're like, Hey, we really have to use your room for this blah, 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 whatever today. And I'm like, okay. And so I'll just grab a couple of things that I have. Mm-hmm. And that's when, you know, I sit down and I just like go for it. And I, sometimes I'm flying by the seat of my pants and I'm like, let's do this. But I would tell a teacher who doesn't have, um, the resources, if your district will allow, do something like donors choose. Mm-hmm. Um, our district does not, we're not allowed to do donors choose and that's okay. Um, but I would say do donors choose, ask for sponsorships, um, you know, say, Hey, if your business would be willing to help me purchase 10 ukuleles, we'll put a plaque in the music room or, you know, something like that. Um, and go ask for donations. Like if you don't have any drums, go to Lowe's and see if they'll give you 10 buckets and you can have some bucket drums and then slowly start asking your administration for things like not a lot, just, Hey, I really could use a hundred dollars worth of hand drums or, um, but don't get discouraged because even if you have nothing, you can still sing and have fun and be musical with your kids, whether that's going outside and playing, you know, Obisana or something, you know, you can have those moments and then still just kind of slowly step into that. Hey, I could it, could we possibly have this or, Hey, could you sponsor me? But don't be afraid to ask for help. Yeah. I think that's a big part of it is just ask because a lot of times people don't know you need anything unless you ask. And there are people out there willing to help. That's so true. Absolutely. That's why I love the Amazon clear the list thing right now, because, you know, so many people don't have anything and they can just, you know, post it and somebody can help you. Oh, that's amazing. I love that. So at your school, every school has behavior problems. Mm -hmm. And I don't like using that phrase, but you know what I mean. Right. At a Title I school with low-income kids, what I noticed with my own my own school environment is the kids would come in with so many issues they're dealing with in their home life that were just Mm -hmm. so hard. Or, you know. Um, we had issues with some bullying of being made, you know, kids being made fun of because they couldn't afford things. Um, and so I feel like a lot of behavior issues were formed around these things they would just bring in that kids shouldn't have to deal with. Mm-hmm. And so teacher listening to this right now, who is at a title one school, or maybe they're starting at a title one school this year, a low income school, and they're not used to that environment. They're, you know, Every school has a different environment and, you know, there's going to be behavior problems no matter where you're at. But what are some ways that you have just loved on your students? And when you see these hard situations that come up and just give us any advice about that. So I was completely 
I had no clue my first year. I'm like, I don't know how to do this. I don't know what to do. And I really wasn't sure, but I knew I had some stickers and I knew little kids love stickers. And so anytime I would see, you know, one of my kids doing something, I'm like, oh my gosh, come get a sticker, you know, and it's just evolved from then. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have since come up with like a, a system where they get a point every day. I mean, just for being in class, you show up to my class, you get a point. Um, and I kind of let them self track, but I also like, you know, you see that one, thing, it's like, I have 20 points. You're like, you do not, there is no way you have 20 points right now. Like, um, but I kind of just let them self monitor because a big part of our school is leader in me and it's a big part of it's tracking. And so they're kind of responsible for themselves. Um, but I have a prize box and it's not anything like an iPad or, you know, right. <laughs> Target dollar spots, my best friend, Oriental trading, my best friend. And these kids will go crazy over getting a pencil. Yeah. You know, they, they just crave that approval. Mm -hmm. They want you to see them. They want you to notice them. Um, and our school this year is adopting this, um, philosophy, I guess you'd call it, um, called conscious discipline Mm -hmm. where you, you kind of change the way you word things, which it's nice because I've kind of always done that without knowing I was doing it, but, you know, really focusing on, okay, this child is acting out this way. What are they trying to tell me with their behavior? Mm -hmm. You know, we had a student last year that unfortunately got removed right around spring break. Mm -hmm. Um, But this child would rip things off the walls. He would throw things in the classrooms. He would punch you. He would bite you. He would kick you. And I mean, who's not, honestly, who's not going to get tired of that? Who's not going to get frustrated with that? I mean, I totally get it, but it was getting to the point where nobody knew what to do with him. And we were having to call the police and we were having to, you know, do all these things. And I knew he kind of had a hard, hard situation and a hard life. And I got to the point where I was like, okay, what is he trying to tell me? Like, Mm -hmm. does he feel unsafe? Does he feel threatened? Why is he triggered? you know, and so he would have these meltdowns or he would just shut down. It was one or the other. He's flying off the handle or he would shut down. And so I started, you know, if he was having a meltdown, it probably wasn't the most popular thing to do, but I would get another student to get one of the coaches and that coach would either take my class and leave me with him or they would watch my class and I would get him in the hallway and I would just sit down with him like on the floor and have a conversation you know, like I noticed that you are shutting down. How are you feeling? You know, and just kind of breaking down that barrier um, to the point where when he got mad and would run away, he would run to my classroom and they'd let him cool off in the back of my class, mm. you know, and I know things were going on at home and he ended up moving, but it's just that whole thing of relationships and no, your kids are not usually going to come out and say, you know, I got punched in the face last night because X, Y, and Z but they might tell you, you know, things are really stressful or we don't have enough money or, you know, I'm really tired. And more often than not, they're tired or they're hungry, or they just want you to see them, whether that's, Hey, I'm doing really awesome and excelling in this one thing, or I'm going to act out because I still want that attention. And so for me, it always goes back to relationships because those kids know when they come in my class, I mean business and we're going to get to business, but we're also going to have fun. And they also know that I love them because I've always told them there's not something you can tell me that I'm not, that's going to make me not love you. You know, I'm not going to be like, Oh my gosh, I can't love you because you said X, Y, and Z Mm -hmm. or, you know, they'll have a meltdown and I'll go find a kid. If they tear up my room, I'll go find them later that day or the next day. And I'll just be like, Hey, how are you? Like, how are you feeling? You know, and just connect with them. And they're like, I'm really sorry, miss. I'm like, no, it's okay. Like I appreciate it, but I want to make sure you're okay. And once they see that I value them as a human being, not just some little kid that's in my class, that changes everything, you know? So my advice for a new teacher would be build those relationships. And yeah, there are going to be hard days and there are going to be days where you want to run for the hills. And there are going to be days when you are transitioning classes and you have tears running down your cheeks because that class was so hard but it gets better and they're going to test you. They're going to, oh, yeah. they're going to see just how far they can push it with you. So stand firm in your, you know, 
classroom management. Mm -hmm. um, stand firm in that, but also get to know them and just do small things to show them you love them. Because my kids will work for 10 points to get something out of the prize box. And it may be a pencil or a bouncy ball, but it's like you gave them a million dollars, you know, and then you get to show them like you did that. You worked hard. You did, you took care of business, you know? Yeah. That would be my best advice. Oh, I love all of that. I do. And I have, there's a quote that I can't remember where I read it, but you've probably heard it. The kids who act out the most, it's, they're the ones that are craving the most love or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's so true. I mean, I, it, it would break my heart sending some of these kiddos home because I would hear about drive-by shootings that happened the night before, or like you said, they're tired. Some of them would be getting their brother or sister ready for school because mom or dad got home from, they had to work overnight and they couldn't wake up. Um, I mean, oh my gosh, I could go on and on, but sometimes for kids, their safe spot is school. Right. That might be the only good meal that free lunch they're getting might be the only meal they're getting that day. And and they're acting out. Sometimes they're like probably holding it in at home a lot. And so when they come to school, that it's like a release almost that they just sometimes don't know how to sit still. They don't know how to follow rules because they've never been given any. And it just becomes really hard. But like you said, a huge part, I've shared this before of classroom management is the relationship aspect. Yes, have rules. Yes, have procedures. Those are very, very important. Mm -hmm. But equally as important is the relationship part of it, because when you set that up and your kids, like you said, know that you care about them, it's not going to always be perfect, but they're going to want to do right. And they're going to want to learn from you. And then it'll just kind of get easier and easier as you gain confidence in yourself, but as they get to know you as well. Oh, absolutely. And I think I come from such a unique perspective because I grew up in a Title I school in a very small school, um, but I grew up in a very dysfunctional home. And so I was, I was one of my kids. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of can relate. I never really acted out, but when something happened, I would shut down. Like I would be that kid that would just stare through you and like, there's no getting through until I had to process through it. And so I think for me, just remembering like, that was you, you need to, re you need to remember where these kids are, you know? And so I think Unfortunately, for a lot of us as educators, we share that, you know, some of us don't, but I think a lot of us have come from those kind of situations and you will never know the kind of impact you had on one of your kids because I became a teacher because of my kindergarten teacher. So you never know what kind of impact you're having on those students. And so just meeting them right where they're at, you know, is super important. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the planting the seed thing. A lot of times, have you had like a middle schooler come back and just mm -hmm. thank you when you thought it was one of those kids that was never paying attention and you were not getting across to them or getting through to them at all. And then they came back and thanked you for just making a difference in their life. And you're like, what? <laughs> I know. Or you have like <laughs> in the year last year, I had these seventh grade girls one of them, she was like the model student, right? She never got in any trouble, anything. And the other one, she would like get in fights, whatever. So they both ended up coming up to the school at the end of the year to do something with little siblings. And they both were like, miss, we just love you. And they were talking to me and they both had gotten suspended mm. for like smoking pot in middle school. Oh, gosh. But they were like, <laughs> they were like, miss, we know you would have never judged us, but you would have told us, you know, you're better than this. Why are you trying to do this? And th they said, we didn't want to tell you because <laughs> we knew you'd be disappointed, but you wouldn't judge us. So even when they like go on, they still come back, they'll tell on themselves, mm. They're like, but we know you love us. I'm like, I do. And you know, you're capable of more than that. Right. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. But it's just so funny because they come back and they're like, miss, I got to tell you what I did. <laughs> you know, and you're like, okay okay, child. And they're like, okay, hey, mom, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because so it's the relationship part of it again, which is Absolutely. amazing. Absolutely. Well, Audrey, I have loved this conversation. And before we go, I would love for you to tell everybody where they can find you. And then any last minute advice you have for any of the teachers listening. Awesome. Well, you can find me on Instagram. Um, my I almost said personal, but my classroom handle is at Miss Jones Music Room all one, um, miss M I S S not M S. So at miss Jones music room. And if you go to Facebook, I'm also there. 
I also have a page, Miss Jones Music Room. I try to keep up with it as much as I do Instagram, but you know, it is what it is. Um, you can also find my personal accounts from there. So I don't care if you follow me there. It's too, it's fine too. Um, but I think my last advice for anyone who's listening is you are in this for a reason. You are a teacher, an educator, an administrator, um, whatever, whoever you are, whatever your job is, you are in this profession for a reason. And it's not to give kids A's, it's not to give kids B's, it's to make those relationships and to know that for eight hours of the day or nine hours of the day, you are entrusted with the lives of someone's child. And they may not be getting that love at home, but that little human being is going to know for those eight or nine hours that they are loved and that they are safe. And so on your hardest days, count three things you're thankful for. And remember that there are so many little human beings who love you for who you are. And they're glad that you're alive, even if they may not say it. So don't give up and know that you're here for a purpose and you're here for a reason. So Oh, this conversation has been amazing. And I am so glad you got to come on to the this podcast and just share your expertise and your story and just for being so vulnerable and real. I really do appreciate that. Well, thank you for having me. It's been awesome. Yeah, thank you so, so much. And all of her links that she shared will be in the show notes. So make sure you check Audrey out because you will gain so much value from her. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening in to the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. And while you're there, I would love for you to review the show and leave a rating on iTunes. To find out more about how I can help you gain momentum in your elementary music teaching career, head to thedomesticmusician.com where you'll find free downloads, courses, the blog, and so much more. Continue teaching music and never doubt the impact you're making each and every day in the lives of your students.